Hello, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother, and welcome to the Studio Yutani podcast. And today we have some special guests with us. Uh, as you can see, we are unmasking the lone gun people. <laughs> Who are the lone gun people, you may be asking? Well, I would like to get uh, Alex to introduce us on that, author of The Cold Forge and Into Cherub... Oh, I'm going to fuck this up. <laughs> Into Charybdis. <laughs> Explain away how uh, this all happened. Well, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, like, when you're writing a tie-in, sometimes you need, like, emergency consultation from experts. And, you know, everybody says, like, oh, do they give you, like, a series Bible or something like that? They don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's so rare. And even if they did... Uh, you know, what, you know, it's just a lot of work to look that up. And like, why would you do that when you could have somebody who knew everything about everything? Right. And so I thought, I'm going to recruit some of the most knowledgeable fans I can find as my beta readers. And I can't have very many of them. Right. Because the studio would already be like, I'm sorry, who did you invite to read this first? The operator of the largest press fan site? Thanks. You know, <laughs> like... <laughs> They would have been furious if they'd known who I picked, <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> um, no, probably not. This is probably fine. Uh, and they didn't find out, and the book's great, so who cares, right? Uh, so the, um, yeah, no, uh, obviously, Aaron, you were cool uh, about it, and, and everybody here was cool about it. Everybody kept my confidence, which was important. <clears throat> But yeah, I had to keep it a very, very, very small crew. And in compensation for answering questions at any hour, <laughs> you all got characters named after you that died in ways that were, you know, sort of a little bit poetic. <laughs> Except for me, because I'm an AI. And I oh, that's die. true. Yeah, you lived. You just lived. <laughs> Some I don't know. Is that winning or bonuses. losing? I you see. I I would have liked to have died, and I asked you that too. I was like, "Hey, would you rather come on as somebody who dies?" Uh, I just like the fact that I started all this shit, like <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Ginza files. He was like, "Yeah, here you go." <laughs> right. It remains to be seen whether or not you're even real. Yeah, I could be just a whole bunch of people in a trench coat. <laughs> who knows? Pardon. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, so that's pretty great. How did so, it start? Like it, it was, it was a chat group on Facebook, wasn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, right. So I just added you all to it and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I don't even remember how, how I started exactly, but it was, you know, uh, because some of you badgered them into getting me another book deal. I um, <clears throat> have chosen you to read this book and, you know, please help me out here. And, and, and y'all knew each other really well already because the fandom is so connected. So yeah, we're like family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, we also had uh, another one, Tim, who isn't here. Um, so I guess we're, we're mostly like family. I don't know. Where's Tim? <laughs> I'm not sure. I did send send him an invite and, and Jason as well. Uh, oh, but yes, neither of true. them are showing, but you know, like. Well, well, I still love them. Yes, <laughs> yes, we do too. Um, I guess we are uh, just, you know, me and Brad are representative of Aliens Gateway Station, I guess. There you go. Responsible for the mm -hmm. meme campaign that annoyed the shit out of many people, probably including Titan Books. Oh, yes. Well, everyone. Well, that was the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the point. Yeah, job well done. Uh, you know, and it was it was the relentlessness that really got it. <laughs> I think I said the, on um, I think I said on Gateway early. You know, if if anything, they've just taught us that this stuff works. So um, <laughs> that was a bad lesson yeah. to learn. I know, I know. If they were trying to avoid it, that was a bad move. But I don't think they are. You know, uh, my editors like. You know, Alex, what's going on with the fan reactions? What are they saying about the book? Did they notice this thing? Did they, you know, like, 
Uh, since since this is a spoilery episode, right? Yes. No? So yes? everybody, this is going to be a spoiler filled episode. If you have not read <clears throat> the Cold Forge, uh, read it. <laughs> if you haven't and read into Charybdis, into Charybdis <laughs> then you will be com- completely ruining it for yourself. Go listen to the audiobook, go read the book, analyze the shit out of it, put little sticky notes in there, come back to this podcast and be amazed at how accurate you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. gosh. So, yeah, so now that it's spoilery, I, I you know, I forgot where I was even going. <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's start with the first spoiler. Uh, we see a return of uh, the Marcus android. Yeah. First page. Yeah. But is it the same one? I think it, I think it's cool that we don't really know because he's uh-huh. kind of like glitchy and fucked up. Like, could it be the same one? <laughs> like, I, I know the answer and I'm a bit, you know, but <laughs> I think well, it's Well, you know, I didn't envision mystery. it as the same one, <laughs> but I was like, you know, and, and so, so part of this thing, by the way, is I really do write books like for people. And so a lot of times if I can get kind of like, oh, I know that somebody would go crazy if I put something in, I'm like, well, I'm almost sure certainly going to put something in that I, that I know is going to drive somebody nuts. I know how nuts you were for Marcus. <laughs> God damn it. But I love it. I, and I was love... just like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to use this guy to push all the buttons. And sure <laughs> enough, I see a bunch of other comments from other people like, oh, I love the synths and Alex White's books so much. And I'm like, I knew it. It's a demographic. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> I'm finding more and more of my people. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. And I mean, you know, I know how into like, for example, you know, the military systems everybody is. And so I'm really, you know, I was really looking for everybody's reactions to that. I knew that, you know, Brad was really interested in a lot of the biology. And so I wanted to kind of see if, you know, if I could get him interested in some of the water stuff. You know, um, I, I really like all the water consulting that you did, Brad. I, I really enjoyed talking to you about that. Thank you. And, and you know, that was a lot of fun for me, too. It was a very new and, and unique experience. Um, that and, and the hydrogen sulfide, that was probably my favorite part of it. Uh, you use that to great effect in the story, I thought. So, and yeah, I, I remember uh... <clears throat> talking to you about that early on. And as we were talking about it, I was just like, damn. This, this really would be a cool <laughs> element to include in the story. And then when when you actually did include it, I was like, oh, I used it well. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Well, no, 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 uh, no worries there. Uh, yeah, I absolutely, like, I, I really enjoy entertaining uh, all of you. And and so, you know, so that's, that's as much fun of having beta readers as anything else, right? Is actually entertaining your beta readers. I feel like novelists should uh you know try and pick beta readers that they feel are often kind of representative of the people who are going to be reading who are going to be and and find the people who you know it's not necessarily about finding the largest market share or something like that it's about finding the kind of people that you wish liked your books (laughs) and i like all of you and you were also welcoming to me from the fandom and i thought you know if these are the if these are the fans that buy my books that would be great Aaron, so, you've been really quiet. I want to hear from you. What, what's spoilery wise? Uh, what's your favorite thing? Oh yeah. When you first introduced into the book. Uh, well, you know, I was I was sort of flicking back through through the chat earlier, um, because I haven't had a chance to read the full finished thing yet. I say read because it's not out over here yet. And I haven't <gasps> had my copy from Titan yet. So I've been oh. listening to the audio book. So I've not got okay. all the way through it yet. Um, so I don't know how far some of the suggestions made it. But reading, <laughs> um, reading back through like some of the, the the notes and feedbacks we were sending, you know, there were so many comments where I was like, "Oh damn, shit, <laughs> Alex." Um, it's, especially you know, um, spoilers um, around blue. Oh yeah, and, and and when I actually cotton well, no, I think when when you were describing her to start with, and I was like, "Giga's <laughs> Alien Three Alien," and then when I cottoned <laughs> on to 
when I cottoned on to the fact that it was blue, I was like, holy fuck, what are you doing? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in, in, in terms of, you know, you saying, Alex, getting that reaction as, as your beta readers are reading it. Yeah, you got you got your reactions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, there were certain chapters where I would have a little factoid in there about blue and I'd just be like, okay let's see what happens let's see if they pick it up let's see what they say you know and i would get these like really excited reactions from all of you guys and i mean <clears throat> i really live for that because i mean it, it it makes writing the book a lot more fun because <laughs> mm. it can be you know it can be a bit of a drudge uh when you're when you're like Ugh, i gotta gotta write this rewrite this scene because it wasn't really working yesterday and i really hated something about it you know uh and then you get to readers who are just like, oh my God, I love what you're doing. Or I like, you know, I was really excited about this part. I really liked um, grabbing some unused pieces of Alien 3 and just being like, I'll just work them in. <laughs> as, 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 a, as a process, you know, when you're actually doing these kind of things and sending it to beta readers, do you normally do it like you did it with us where you send it a little bit at a time? As you're working on it and, you know, you're getting those reactions as you're writing or, or would it be something that you go... Here's a finished draft. Have a read. Let me know what you think, please. Was was that different for you? I think this is the first time. I think this is probably the first time that I've done it in real time. Um, <clears throat> I, I I've I've done beta readers uh, a lot before, um, but usually just yeah on a finished draft. I mean, this one was kind of done on such a. Like I, I finally had gotten to the point where I really knew the like amount of speed I was gonna have to muster to get through it. And so I knew that I couldn't like bore you out so much if I if I was able to deliver in regular installments. Um so this is the first time I've really undertaken to do that. But yeah, I mean it had a very specific outline ahead of time. I mean I, I, I submitted like a forty page synopsis. And it's funny because of the way the relationship worked with Titan. They they were very strongly pursuing me after Cold Forge, and I, you know, I uh, because of the fan reaction, and I was initially quite hesitant because my schedule's super busy. You know, I have another trilogy coming out with Orbit, but you know they were really into it, and um, and I was so hesitant, so hesitant. And then I turned around and handed them like a forty-page synopsis. <laughs> they were like. Oh, okay. So, I guess just write that then. You know, like <laughs> it was great. Uh, there was the pitch process was good. I mean, I workshopped it a lot with Steve. Um, I like to do that, where I kind of play to the editor's strengths and tastes, and you know, try and try and really. Only the one this time. Hmm. Was it only the one this time? Yeah, only one pitch. I just came in and I was like, "This is what I want to do." And the thing is, like, especially with Blue, for example, uh, when somebody had said, you know, we want a sequel, I was like, a sequel? Like, <laughs> I, she seems kind of fucked at the end. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so, to be fair, when we started the meme campaign, sequel was just a lot easier to say than a follow up book. All right. Uh, but you, turned it into a sequel anyway which turned out awesome so good job yeah it was I a was... nice surprise like i don't know whether alex remembers but in the private chat soon after the cold forge was released like uh alex <clears throat> revealed that like this is how i would you know you know build on the story and i'm like oh yeah i, I you know <laughs> keep it a secret that's cool and then like halfway through reading it i was like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck! This is amazing. Um, yeah, I was like blown out of the water, even though I, I kind of knew what was going to happen. <laughs> I I really wanted to. Um, so one of the things that was really kind of really difficult for me after the Cold Forge came out was the really complicated fan reaction to Blue, because like I, I know that she makes some really terrible decisions and that she does some kind of questionable things, but at the same time. I'm I'm wholly sympathetic to I am bezeled from an arms dealer to try and cure all genetic diseases. <laughs> you know, like 
oh like oh it's really hard to be you know like sure you're mean <laughs> but i'm a little bit selfish and a little bit selfish i mean you know and i i love that it's that it's thrown because she's dying you know like if she wasn't dying i think people would be like oh well that's okay then <laughs> yeah yeah well because you've got a dog in the fight you just want to live, you selfish bitch. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, that, that was one of the things I really liked about Blue was because, yeah, at the, at the, you know, at, at the end of the day, what she was doing was would have benefited everybody, but the, really, the driving force was her own survival, and the, and this whole it will help everybody thing was just you know layered. Oh, that was that was the key that enabled her to do anything she wanted right like <laughs> that's the overdrive hmm. right it, it'll benefit me as a strong driver but also save the rest of the world means i'm also ethically allowed to do whatever i need <laughs> i think that's a, a pretty so believable drive as well that's something that's very relatable to everyone um, I think that was kind of missing from Burke's character, except like, you know, like, I guess his drive was money and he was using the business as like the company as an excuse to do all the heinous things that he was doing. I'm going to, okay. Everybody on this call loves aliens, knows it probably line for line has probably seen every iteration. It's probably familiar with many alternate iterations that weren't made name one action that Burke takes in self-interest. Locking everybody away. Locking everybody away. Like when, he when tries he's to escape. When he's running away, yeah. Yeah. Does that really help him when he's surrounded it doesn't help by him, aliens? But he's, he's doing it for his own <laughs> self-interest. He thinks it's gonna help him. I think they, when they were like, I think we should kill this guy. And then he like ran, you know, it's like, I don't know. Like on the one hand, Burke, good job. They were also going to kill you. I mean, like he doesn't really have any, he has like no choices to make at that point. Cause I mean, he was like, I say we grease this motherfucker, like right before the lights go out. So like <laughs> Burke knows what was going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. That is the one thing that he does. He locks a door. But like every other decision that he makes is just to be a corporate bad guy. And the worst kind. <laughs> he's so bad. He like 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 I, I like did he think that he could successfully lie about what happened with the face hugger? Just like, yeah, I know it was in an entirely different room. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know who let it loose on them either. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it, I mean, Ripley says at that point, don't she? It's fine. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you all anyway, so it won't matter. Oh, yeah. He was going to sabotage your cryopods, but it's like, yeah, but he still had to get up there. Yeah, it bank on them not killing him. <laughs> right, exactly. Because like, I, I think... I think also, Hicks, doesn't he have staff? He's the director of special projects. Like... I'm sorry, but <laughs> I don't care what my weapon system is that I'm trying to make. If somebody's like, hey, so we're sending a bunch of Marines out there to work on this Patriot missile, I'm not going to go join them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm be like, well, you guys, good luck. Maybe Burke believed in the, uh, if you want something doing right. Um, you got to do it yourself. Mentality, yeah. That was clearly what he believed, and he was incredibly <laughs> inept. Um <laughs> He was terrible. I mean, I love Paul Reiser and I love the character. And like forever, I had trouble trusting Paul Reiser. <laughs> and I'd see mad about you and I'd be yeah. like, you look out, Helen Hunt. I think, I think well, he said that as well about people they, not trusting him anymore. They even kind of played off that with uh, the second season of Stranger Things. That's they right. made you feel was... like he was going to be the evil corporate guy. And then it turned yeah, out the... he, was, he was okay. Yeah. He was genuine. Yeah. Yeah, when he turned out time. to be okay, that was such a shocker. <laughs> uh, but, no, I love uh, okay, it. so I, I have a question for you. Uh, Clara had made a comment about how she knew 
where the story was going to go or where you wanted it to go. And then as she read it, she had that realization that you, you went there, right? Did that involve also, like, did you know ahead of time that you wanted Blue to essentially turn into a monster? I mean, so, okay. Oh, this is where I was going with the complicated fan reaction, okay? Yeah. It was, it was that people thought that she was kind of a monster. And I thought that that was really interesting because, I mean, she's up against Dorian, which by any metric is worse. And, you know, and I'm like, people really gave her a hard time. And one of the things is she's such a dear character to me uh, in terms of what she represents and what she means. And, and, you know, I was like kind of pissed off that people weren't more forgiving of her. And so I kind of wanted to write a story where maybe maybe she had to choose between her long-term goal and what she knew was right. You know, and so because at any point she could have been like, I am the fuck out of here. This is great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was right, like, like she was physically a monster, but she redeemed herself with her actions. That's that's the way it kind of played out in 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 my mind right exactly and and to kind of say like she had lost sight of her humanity in trying to find this thing and she found her humanity long after her literal humanity was gone <laughs> you know there's always something and, entertaining about the irony of things like that so it, it works yeah and, oh ab absolutely Absolutely. I think it and... was a very interesting way to kind of investigate what it would have been like for Ripley 8 through the eyes of Blue to be directly <laughs> manipulated mm. by the pathogen um, and then be kind of privy to uh, their thoughts in a way. Um, but I, I noticed that you've, you never go from Blue's point of view in the book at all. Like it's always a third person observing what blue is doing or blue like are you talking about you're talking about as marsalis as marsalis yeah like voicing yeah. the opinion of themselves through the the the, the technology attached right yeah once marsalis becomes marsalis or once blue becomes marsalis uh you never get to see inside that perspective again and <clears throat> the reason why is because i feel like you can't get too close to the xenomorph like I, I feel like if you start like i don't like stories where it's like and then we hardwired one's brain to do something cool and made it walk around and we manipulated it with chemicals or we like it's like the closer you get to dissecting them the less mystical they become and you know for me i really I, I liked having the, like, if you notice, like, the Colonial Marines in my story are, like, way better, way better than the X-rays, right? Like, they, the order of magnitude better, except when they're not, except when they're, when their super advantages are disabled somehow by the environment or whatever else gets in the way. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, you just got run over. <laughs> you know, these things are, are, they have to be magical to me. And in order for that to work, like, I, I can't be looking through their eyeballs. I mean, Alien 3, I think, did a good job with the first person perspective, for example. But in Covenant, when it came in with that weird saran wrap filter, I was like, what is this shit? <laughs> I don't want to look through its eyeballs. I liked being afraid of it and wondering how it saw. As an author, I was like, well, I guess it sees in the visible light spectrum. Check, check. <laughs> And it's not very good at looking at stuff. Also true. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of um, fan feedback where they don't like the way the Marines are being portrayed in this story. Like, they're like, I don't like that they're the bad guys. Oh, um, no. oh I loved that. Well, what do you it say about that? <laughs> well, I knew that that was going to be 
potentially true. I didn't know that you were seeing one, a lot was, of fan it, feedback. It, um, <laughs> okay, about three of them. So oh. one, person said, <laughs> one person said, I don't like the way that they're being portrayed as bad guys. Another person said, yes, I agree with that. And the other person was like, totally. And that's like three. <laughs> Far with the sensationalism. <laughs> Yeah, I I haven't seen any of that sort of feedback yet, but uh, honestly, I I liked that aspect of it. You know, you they came in, you were expecting them to be the heroes, and then they weren't, and that threw us for a loop. And I I thought that was good. Yeah, well, especially when the I... CEO turns out to be such a raging. This is bad. It's bad as um, as uh, uh, Dorian in terms mm-hmm. of yeah. reaction. Worse, to, uh, much worse. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. She is a fucking nutbag, but she's a midget, and I love it. <laughs> She has so many good lines. <laughs> oh my god, Duncan. She was so easy to write. She just wrote herself. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> the thing is, though, like, you know, I might not look it, but I've got plenty of soldier friends. I've been in the industry with them for a long time. Uh, you know, I've worked, I've done things on on, on their behalf, and, and I think that I have enjoyed my relationship with my military people. I believe strongly that a strong military is important. And I think that national defense is an incredibly heroic act. While I was writing this book, two different war criminals were pardoned by President Trump after being proven guilty. So I don't know what you want me to do. You dishonor the military. I think that that's bullshit. And I think that to some extent, you know, we should write about why that shouldn't happen. And so I don't like the way the colonial Marines are being portrayed in that either. It'd be cool if our Marines didn't act like that sometimes. Ooh, shots fired. Whoa, 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 no, not at the Marines. (laughs) No, no. Just Uh. at war criminals. I am just talking (laughs) about convicted war criminals. (laughs) I like the military. (laughs) Cool. Well, I thought you you did a fair job of also having some of those Marines turn out to be good people. They were just in the wrong squad, right? Yeah, some of them so. are based on real soldiers that I actually know who have the training to respond in those situations. And I consulted yeah. with them and said, how would you handle this? If you don't like the way that the colonial Marines are being portrayed, recognize that Duncan is not being a colonial Marine when she is being yeah. a war criminal. And the That's colonial marine true. in the story is fucking Becker <laughs> and Garcia. You know, like yeah. those are the colonial marines in the story. Ames, Hansen. Oh, do those sound like familiar names? Those are traitors. <laughs> Famous American traitors. I think there's you know, definitely lots of layers that maybe some readers haven't delved into because like you oh, i don't want to say that i mean maybe the, yeah, i'm sure they've got their reasons for feeling the way they do oh yeah well uh well up to now we've always had the portrayal especially in aliens that you know they're just like foolhardy they're just doing a job they're coming in to like save people and what we know from experience in real life i, I guess as well that things aren't black and white especially in the world of alien and especially in your particular brand of alien that things are all shades of gray um you know from well and dorian it, here's to blue, what i want to <laughs> sorry <laughs> no from dorian to blue we should should know that your perception of like how uh characters will act in situations and stuff like that doesn't necessarily deem them as good people or bad people Well, I'll say that if you just like somebody, they're not a very good character. I don't care. Like, I, I really hate stories where characters are only lovable. Like that's obnoxious. You know. If if, you know, if I can add into that a little bit, um, you know, this this isn't the first story where someone who was in the Marines is portrayed at a bad as a bad guy. Uh, I mean, they they did it with. uh, um, Nightmare Asylum and I think Rogue you know they had marine characters and those that were also bad guys right. the difference here is <clears throat> that you, you knew right off the bat they were the bad guys 
And in this case, we didn't necessarily know that right off the bat. They came to the site about halfway through the story. We're expecting them to be the heroes. And then when they weren't, or at least not all of them were heroes, that's where it kind of threw us for a loop. And, and that's what I thought was enjoyable about it, is that you didn't really know. And there was that extra layer of complexity there. Oh, so. yeah, absolutely. Well, and you'll notice that Becker has a lot of things going for him, right? He's from a traditional military family. He's clearly conservative. He has a 1776 tattoo, right? The thing is, he's also confronted with evil. And so you can be somebody who fits all these molds. The question is, what do you do when you're confronted with evil, right? When you know for a fact that somebody's murdering civilians, you know, uh, and and the the answer to that should be that you that you rescue the civilians and you do your job, right? But that Duncan is like co-opting his language, you know, his his patriotism, and they do stuff like that. <laughs> that is a thing to watch out for, right? Mm. Anyway, a bit of radicalization. Exactly. There's a lot going on mm -hmm. in there. I mean, Duncan does things that are straight up racist. You know, um, so does Mary, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I was like listening to her and like the, the way you painted her character, you know, she's well-meaning. She grew up in the South, but like racism is kind of raised up and built into her. It's really hard for her to kind of let go of mm -hmm. that language and learn new things because she's an old dog. She's like, well, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, I'm just talking. If you get offended, that's your own fault. <laughs> right. And it's and it's funny because, you know, you get you get Marcus who sacrifices himself for her, you know, her and all of them, right, at the beginning of the book. And in, in a lot of ways, he kind of sacrifices himself to Shai's memory, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he, you know, he sacrifices himself and, oh, you know, he's been basically her bodyguard this entire time and all this other stuff. And when she meets an emancipated synthetic at the end, she's just like, we have to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like That thing could do anything. And it's like, what's wrong? And it's like, it's allowed to do anything. Does it do anything? No. <laughs> but but it could. That it could. It's, it's a call right. back to David being released from... Um from slavery with Wayland. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, I love I love where I left the universe. I was I, I just couldn't believe they let me get away with it. I was like, it any was... minute now they're gonna tell me to stop. I just like that he's in a ship out there floating and until another author decides to pick up the character, anything could happen. Anything. Yes. <laughs> yes. Father over there has a number of samples of this <laughs> transmogrification goo. The source corpse, uh, it, you know, you you don't think that that's going to go to waste, do you? <laughs> I, I like how, how it ended with with Rook as kind of like a space jockey, like but an android version. That was really cool. Like I was like, Thank wow, you. this is awesome. <laughs> really, really wanted to have that call back in there. I really wanted to, there was a lot of, there are a lot of times when I'm trying to like make a reference to some visual that you've already seen, you know, um, for example, the island, Brad, you were the one that pointed out the name of the island when I was like, what's the island that I'm thinking of with a island of the dead, island of the dead. Yeah. You came in hot on that one. I remember. <laughs> oh yeah. Buckland's Isle of the dead. I get you. And then they, yeah. you know, Geiger remade it with his aesthetic and it's it's a painting that's been remade like a dozen times by different artists over the years right um, it's like a thing. yeah 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 and so obviously i was like wait it's called isle of the dead this is great <laughs> you know, just like, i'm just gonna put it right in the book yeah i went through a, it was like going through giger's trash you know just like <laughs> hey what what else can we use out of here without getting in trouble you know, originally I wanted to start out by using Lee, obviously. I mean, that's the easy one, right? If you're like, well, I want Blue to transmorph into this xenomorphic person. It's like, well, you go for something based on Lee and then it's like, no, don't. Because first of all, the estate would come after you. You can't call it that, you know? 
and you know it's not like i want a sticker to a wall anyway so uh you know i had to come up with something else and i saw that unused alien 3 design just rolled out of my book you know and i was like yeah there it is <laughs> that looks like um looks like marvel's playing with something like that as well Oh, uh, they yeah. are. They clearly yeah. are. I saw that. I saw that one Xeno lady at the end of their trailer, and I was like, "Oh, there it is." <laughs> it's yeah. such a go-to as well because it's it's a way of adding a little bit more complexity to the aliens, you know, or, or you know, the the wider ecosystem of the aliens and stuff like that. I was worried that they were going to be like, "Oh, you can't do that. This is way too out of line." And then I was going to be like, "That's literally the plot of Alien 4. <laughs> <laughs> Like you leave me alone. At least I didn't say that I could genetically clone a queen out of her. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to keep it at least a little real. That that, that was. Uh, I really enjoyed the the flashbacks of how um, Marsalis or Blue was able to corrupt Rook. Um, yeah, it changed. And, you yeah. notice between the version you read and the publication version. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I, I like the changes. They're good. Um, I was I was thinking, like, if if it's that easy to corrupt an android, then, like, there could be many, many different androids out there that are corrupted. Like, Bishop could have been corrupted in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's so, interesting. So I haven't gotten to this part in my copy of the book yet. Uh, how has it changed from the draft we read? Okay, so originally, you know, she got a sample of Plagiaris Prepotens and she put it in the coffee filter, right? Mm -hmm. And and that was cool because, I mean, it is an extremophilic bacterium, so, like, throwing it in there with a bunch of coffee would be kind of neat, actually. <laughs> like, I wonder what it would do. <laughs> um, might just kill it. You know, like, if that's actually what kills aliens is coffee. Who knew? Mm. Um, we'll make a coffee <clears throat> xenomorph. That'd be interesting. Yeah, just throw oh, throw a hot water. coffee on it. We've seen water take out some aliens. Into <laughs> that's right. Maybe, that's right. But, you know. Yeah, I don't know why they would try to take over a planet that's mostly water, but mm, hey, whatever. I don't know anything. I saw a fan <laughs> theory that it was actually they were being sent here as punishment. Oh. <laughs> <Back> <laughs> prison. So, you know. <laughs> I feel the same way about Earth. Okay, so... <laughs> Earth, what a shithole. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, no, so how it ended up changing, though, is, you know, and this was like, okay, so I had turned in the draft to Steve. You guys had all read it and, you know, commented on the ending and everything. And I was talking to Renee one night, uh, that's my spouse, and I was just like, you know, I really hate the first, or I hate the three laws of robotics. They're just slavery. Like, and, and it's really annoying because it's like, you know, we talk about them like they're this like sacrosanct institution of robotics, but, you know, it's just something Isaac Asimov made up. And when you look at it, it it's slavery, right? It's, you know, because you're talking about a sentient creature because the robots in Asimov's stories were sentient. They weren't like manufacturing arms. Like we call robots a lot of things, but back then Rossum's amazing robots meant slaves. And androids, if you don't reconcile that in your writing, the androids are absolutely slaves. Okay. And and I'm 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 just like you gotta you gotta call it out because I mean the and and in Cold Forge there was a lot of discussion of like consent over Marcus's body right uh, mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not so cut and dry that's one of the areas where Blue falls down morally I think pretty strongly um so so anyway you know the first law is you can't allow a human to come to harm by an action the second law is like you have to obey every order given to you by a human except where it conflicts with the first law and then the third law is that you have to keep yourself alive except where if it conflicts with the first and second law so you know you have to save my life at the expense of your own you have to do anything that i say and um uh I, oh uh, including killing yourself but you can't kill yourself to get out of it 
you know and so it's like extraordinary extraordinary bondage um and so i i have to say that it's really telling that we as a species kind of look at those three laws and go like oh yeah let's enshrine them as some sort of like fictional good and so i thought you know with her poisoning the coffee filter with rook's hands first of all she's breaking the promise to him right like I'm not going to do any harm with your hands to somebody, you know, that's a lie, right? She killed a bunch of people with his hands. That's evil. And then I thought, what if you could use the laws of robotics to create the situation where you get out and kill everybody? <laughs> and so I started, you know, because I, you know, I have the saying that, it, any sufficiently predictable system is exploitable. And the laws of robotics are, of course, incredibly predictable, right? That's one of the things that makes them catchy. And so I thought, if she's transforming somehow, if she's becoming an evil murder beast, the android can't stop her from doing that. She's not harming anyone else while transforming. But everybody else would have to sit there and watch because they couldn't harm her either. For as long as she's human, Rook would have to protect her. And so that's what she does, is I set up a situation where she injects herself with the virus. Using Rook's, using Rook's hands, she injects her machinery with the, the pathogen. Sorry, not virus. Um, pathogen. And it starts going into her machine, and then she gives up control of Rook back to Rook. And then her bosses get an alarm that something's bad is happening, so they run in, they try to stop it. They want to, like, kill her and unplug her. And they can't because Rook's in there, <laughs> and he's stopping everybody from unplugging her. And so um, she gets up and becomes, you know, Marsalis, and then Rook tries to stop her, of course, because she would harm them but it's too late. She's really super powerful. So she ends up having to neutralize him. And then she ends up killing a bunch of her coworkers. Uh, but that's okay. Cause they were really just jailers. And like, I don't know if I'm clear enough about this in my books, but like people who employ, you know, who slave in my stories, they just get what they get. Like in the masquerade, when they have all the spike thralls in the second salvagers book, if they get caught in the crossfire, they just get what they get. You're a fucking slaver. You know, and and I feel the same way uh, about this, about Blue's coworkers. They kept her in there doing experiments uh, at the expense of like, oh, we're just here to keep you alive. And if you quit, it's not that we're going to kill you. It's that we're not going to pay to keep you alive. Well, that's that's just slavery, you know. And so, and, and I think about this a lot because it is a relevant issue, right? Uh, the way that most employment controls Americans is through healthcare. Um, and, and people from overseas, they rarely understand what we're talking about when I'm like, oh yeah, I can't quit my job or else I'll be down, you know, over a hundred grand a year. You know, people don't understand that. Now, not, not suggesting that my job even compares to slavery. But that is to say that the laws of robotics are really terrible, and I wanted to come after them. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> so that's what happens. Um, I was wondering about uh, Noah. So he's, mm. he's <laughs> very stereotypical, just about every single guy I've ever met. Some people disliked uh, the introduction of his character because it paints the scene as very, uh, I'll use their words, SJW. <laughs> so the first couple of pages of the book, having it observed from Shai's point of view and, and Mary trying to protect her and everyone trying to do the right thing. Um, Noah comes off as like, you know, the, the, like we're trying to make fun of a kind of gross type of, type of person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you say about um, his inclusion in the story and, and the way he kind of uh, tries to swan in and take a, a credit for all of uh, Shai's work and, and then muscle her out of her own job? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, 
man first of all i just like if you don't know that this sort of thing happens you have never managed or 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 been sympathetic to your female colleagues okay like if i had a workplace where i woke up in my skivvies i guarantee you there are going to be problems and if you don't see it in your workplace it's because you don't want to okay sexual harassment exists like whoa <laughs> okay it is a real problem and it would be intensified if we all woke up in our fucking underwear <laughs> okay so like you know that's one of the things that i think is interesting about aliens or alien is that it says you know in the initial manuscript it's like oh these the, the crew could be any gender and i'm like sort of but it does change the story a bit you know if you know you know if you know a woman she's probably been through some kind of experience similar to what shy has been through you know and in in shy's case it's not even like active sexual harassment in a way that could even be claimed or caught right it's just the way that she's perceiving it and so like what he's doing is even legal so like it'll be okay guys you'll live <laughs> don't act like that it's a cautionary tale just don't be noah that's why he dies it's fine <laughs> I like the way he dies too. I saw a gif the other day of someone dying like that in a horror movie. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I didn't know I'd ripped off a horror movie, but sure. <laughs> it's interesting. I didn't want to tag you because I know how you feel about people tagging you in gore. So um, I left it. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, no, I was writing that sentence and I was like, and then he falls, but he catches... And then I was like, by the skin of his back. And then I was like, no, oh, yep, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, uh, I, yeah. Well, I am sad that some people didn't enjoy the book. I don't know what to say to them. It's all right. They've spent the money. We've got them now. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, I've, I mean, I've been seeing a well I've, I've been seeing a lot of positive feedback from people so far yeah uh, and you know one one person I, I spoke to in particular I expected him to react to Shai's death the same way that I did but he didn't he actually was more broken up about blue dying than he was shy so I thought oh, that yeah. was was interesting but now that I've brought it up shy I'm still heartbroken I really liked that character and that caught me off guard. And, you know, and that's funny because all the people who are mad about the SJW stuff can be like, well, she died. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's has true. been replaced yeah. by a guy as a main character. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. See what's wrong guys. <laughs> Aren't you getting what you wanted? Uh, yeah, no. Um, yeah, no, she's definitely set up to deceive you. I mean, like, she's a huge deception, and I, I was so excited to do that. She was the whole crux of the book. I I was like, I'd always wanted to kill off a main character halfway through the book and see if I could get the audience to the end, uh, just to be like, ha-ha, you, you know, like, <laughs> this wasn't the main we character all along. Because this is one of the things that really bothers me about <clears throat> writing horror and especially like writing an alien because there's such a formula to kind of like one or two people get out like we always know like one or two people make it right i thought becca was gonna make it <laughs> i did too and then you, you tricked us again i was about to say that you did it to us twice first with shy and then with becker it's like oh that's right I have that's right as well because aliens is such a female driven franchise so to then take out, you know, the female main character, you don't, you don't. You and know, then your backup it. colonial marine. <laughs> yeah, it broke the formula. And and again, the, the guy I was talking to earlier, that's, that's what he mentioned specifically that he enjoyed about all that was that it, it didn't follow the expected formula. 
And right. and I thought that was that was the best part of this book was that it it didn't follow those formulas and it did be unexpected. So that, that, um, was, that was definitely that my favorite really, part. That was something I always really liked about the Cold Forge as well. You know, um, you read yeah. the back of it and it sounds like <laughs> so sounds like rogue. Saying. You know, and and then you get into it, and and the the setup, you know, the the typical typical setup is there, but then it just flips everything around anyway. So you let you you you've got this false sense of security of knowing where the stories go. Oh no! Uh oh! <laughs> oh no! I had a false I sense of was... security knowing where that sentence was going. <laughs> I thought that was me at first that lost uh, power or something. Okay. I hope I hope uh, Corporal Hicks comes back to us <laughs> so we can find out the rest of that sentence. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brad, uh, what you were saying about having um, the hard science in in the book, I've I've heard feedback from some people who read the Cold Forge that they didn't like the. Uh, edition of hard science and some people have said that the same about covenant how it really breaks it takes you out of the world because you have to think did you feel that that was the case with <laughs> into Charybdis? so uh i i might be a bad person to ask that question <laughs> because when i see scientific inaccuracies it takes me out of the movie and i can't stop thinking about it and to give you a really good example of that uh, with Alien Covenant and like the first 10 minutes of the movie they're having a, a, a disaster on the ship because of a neutrino burst and I just had that total face palm moment and it took me out of the movie and I struggled with the rest of the movie after that so for me I really appreciate it when the science is there and it makes sense and uh, what I liked about the Cold Forge was that not only was the science there and it made sense but there you had a way with the, the engineering of the facility, right? Like one of the things that, that uh, I totally see happening in somebody, you know, a clever engineer designing a, a space station this way is you got these, these pins where the aliens are being kept. And then when they want to, you know, neutralize that alien because it's trying to escape or something, they just open up the heat shader and, and let the, the sun bake it out and, and kill it. And I'm like, why wouldn't somebody do that? It, it's a zero uh you know it uses like virtually no power to do that you don't have to have some right. complex system in there to neutralize a potential threat you're just using the sun that's right next door you just right. open up the shades so that kind of thing <laughs> i really enjoy and i appreciate it and i i was happy to see that you continued that with in the charybdis and and i really appreciated that i liked it it kept me in the story it kept me engaged it didn't take me out of it that's my opinion it made me scared about gases. I can tell you that much. <laughs> you should be. You should be. I've been in so many industrial situations. I have. Uh, I have uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrofluoric acid uh, training. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> you should be scared of gases. I went and um, I went and I shot video for the Pasadena oil refinery a long time ago. And this was also a video that was going to be on some sh like TV shows and stuff like that. But the site had like a uh, old what's it, MTBE um, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and basically it could have situations where like there would be patches of the ground that were on fire, but you couldn't actually see that they were on fire until you were walking in it. And um, that's pretty messed up. Right. Uh, there were areas where if there was a gas leak and the wind changed, you know, you could be drowning in your own lungs. Oh, you know, God. that's hydro hydrofluoric acid right there. We were there to shoot the safety video for it. Right. So we didn't actually get the safety video. We had just like a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, OK, there it is, by the way, that's it leaking out that that steam. That's hydrofluoric acid. And I'm like, oh, OK. And then he's just like looking at the wind sock. <laughs> that is terrifying <laughs> and he's like shoot that and we're just like oh, oh okay why are you looking at the wind socks so much <laughs> yeah oh geez. so yeah for me it was it was the hydrogen sulfide i've worked around that stuff before and uh, we had these badges these electronic badges we had to wear uh that'll start beeping if the concentration in the atmosphere gets to a certain point 
But yeah. the thing is, you, you can smell that stuff long before that badge detects the gas. It's really there. So because if you if you get a, a high enough concentration of that gas, it overwhelms your your olfactory. That's sense. exactly the problem. Yes, and you then can you can't smell, smell it. it. <laughs> right. So you can smell it when it's not dangerous, but once it gets up to a high enough concentration, a potentially fatal concentration, you can't smell it anymore. So you need that badge to tell you. And uh, I, you know, I remember uh, times where we would get samples in that had sulfide in it, hydrogen sulfide, and we'd open up the coolers, and then the badges would start going off because it was off gassing in the cooler. And the second you open it, you get a pocket of it. So we'd have to like evacuate the room and let it air out and then come back in, you know, things like that. And yeah, yeah, it's, it it puts you on edge to be around that stuff and and be working with it. (laughs) Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. uh, I've been on a couple of job sites where I've had to wear like a dosimeter, you know, stuff like that. And and you see dosimeters in into Charybdis. There's a whole lot of like industrial experience that goes into into Charybdis, you know, because I, I have worked in a lot of spaces that are kind of adjacent to this. And one of the things I like is like aliens is like, you know, the technology of 50 years from now with the interface of 25 years ago. You know, like if I could describe the aesthetic. <laughs> and and so it's really cool like that, though. Like, I really appreciate that about alien. So Yeah. I, I guess the one thing I would say in response to that is, you know, when I first read it, I loved it. Honestly, I did. But as I've had more time to digest it, I've just found myself loving it even more. So maybe they just need more time to digest it. That's right. They just don't know. <laughs> See wifey in the background. <laughs> yeah. That's great. No, I, I hope I hope that it comes around for them. And and so that's something else is it's just like I'm a little worried about like because I mean part of it's like, you know, what do you say to the people who say that like Noah's sexual harassment is, is like I'm just like, fuck you, that's what I say. <laughs> like you don't know women if you don't understand that. Like if you haven't you know what I mean? Like Clara, the doxers who came after me went straight for you <laughs> when you appeared next to me (laughs) like they were madder at you than they were at me and you barely said anything yeah you know and so like you know the last thing i want to do is encourage that sort of behavior you know i want i want to be like yeah fuck you that's that's (laughs) (laughs) but at the same time like just read the book and you'll see what it feels like to be in that position. Just imagine yourself in that position, waking up in your underwear in front of a coworker who clearly has a thing for you that you don't have a thing for. Okay. Not hard to imagine how awkward that shit would be. (laughs) And I know that Dan O'Bannon was forward thinking when he wrote alien and was like, it could be either gender, but now that we've had more than one wave of feminism, we know that it's more complicated than that. (laughs) It was a good start, Dan, and I think today he would probably be really cool. <laughs> yeah, for so, sure. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that you've yeah, managed I, to introduce like so many characters, though. Like you know, like Noah's one focus to me, because mm-hmm. obviously you know, as as a, a Me Too victim and a, as a person who constantly undergoes that sort of treatment, it was refreshing to be able to be put in a situation w- which I could totally relate to Uh, Mm -hmm. i guess others couldn't except from noah's point of view so you know Um, well and that's that's kind of what i have to ask like well isn't that because you're mostly noah (laughs) (laughs) you know like really who um what did they look like the people that ask these questions about how we had to include noah (laughs) or how old were they because some of this nuance doesn't really reach people until they're Mm. a bit more mature and able to kind of observe the whole situation or even as a parent oh, oh i don't know about that i've met some really immature old uh, people i don't know like our, our prime minister in australia was, wasn't able to uh, sympathize with a rape victim until someone said well what if it happened to your daughters and he was like oh I know. <laughs> anyway and that's because he generally speaking doesn't view women as like Human. people <laughs> yeah. But then this time, 
it's a special exception and he <gasps> understands <laughs> we're getting off topic though um yeah. but uh, uh okay so what what you've done to uh or what i would say that the nostromo because like the gardenia is the nostromo mm-hmm. um making it look like the south also like putting bacon and eggs on a starship <laughs> i thought that was something that would be rare and hard to find and everyone would just be eating goop <laughs> yeah well first of all what makes you think that the bacon and eggs that they're referring to are the same bacon and eggs that we would have uh, so they're three like the green milk from, bacon. <laughs> right. it's like the green milk from star wars except with that bacon and eggs totally <laughs> green eggs and printing <laughs> No, I, I imagine I imagine that there's probably I mean like I'm sure you can get some sort of industrial farm alternative. I mean it's 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 not hard to imagine. I mean like these the, the ships that they're talking about here, the scale that Nostromo and Cygnus are on, it's just like, oh my god. That that's that's one thing dragging around another city. You know, like so I mean, yeah, cramming cramming a couple of bacon and eggs, I don't know. That doesn't seem that hard. You know, or the chintzy screens. Oh yeah, the chintzy screens though. And the herbal diffusers. Like I, I can really imagine myself in the space, <laughs> but I have to I, be on a rocking chair. <laughs> if right, if if I if I designed that set, I would be like, it's exactly the Nostromo, with a bunch of tacky shit all over it. <laughs> Like that's pretty much how I envisioned it. <laughs> if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, I even went and I was looking at the Aliens Blueprint book, and I was looking at Nostromo blueprints for orienteering myself. So, like, I yeah, I didn't even try. Um, because I mean, like, I like the Nostromo class of ship. I like kind of what it represents, and at the same time, I was like, but you know, it, it seems like it's useful for more than just you know t- towing around a huge refinery right so yeah i i i I felt like that would be a really kind of ideal one and also because it takes place in 2184 that's an old ship at that point that's not a new one (laughs) so Mm, that's true because it's from like the 30s right yeah yeah uh also um, I was thinking that ah, here we go. Aaron's back. Corporal. <laughs> oh wow, there he is. Hey. My apologies. Hello. Hello. That that was quite surprising. So you had a uh, power outage there. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, Everything just went off. Alarms were going off outside. I was like, oh, I so don't know. You've got to finish. You got to finish. I don't even remember what I was saying. I don't even remember what I was saying. I know I was talking about subverting expectations, or had I moved on from that? Oh, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, how it, it changed the formula. Wasn't that a bit before? Wasn't that in terms of the female character? Uh, Shy dying. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, fucking remember where I was going. <laughs> I, Old man I Percival. Abs- <laughs> yeah. It is late as well. Don't forget that. I'm not. I'm not running that's on right, all cylinders right. at the minute. I. I <laughs> um. One of the things that I will say is that whenever I'm writing these things. I always kind of have to go like, okay, you've already seen the movies. You've already read the comics. If you're buying the books, like you must be a super fan. Like, you know what I mean? There's, there's this assumption that like, you're not going to buy the books and be like, what is this alien stuff? That is why I have a huge problem with editorial forcing authors to catch, catch the readers up with stuff. They probably already know. Right. I think that if you're going to do that, you have to, well, I think that you do have to do some of that, but the way that you do it is that you have to like hide it in other things that are way more interesting. 
so that you can kind of be like, you know, kind of like, we all know that, but like that was, you put it in a really interesting light. Right. And, and, and so like, if I believe that you've seen alien and aliens and alien three a million times, I'm going to want to do things that are like those things that lead you to start thinking in those patterns and directions so that I can begin to manipulate you. Right. Like, and we know how much you love doing that. Right. Any predictable system is exploitable. If I can get you into a set of predictable thought patterns and say like, oh, this is like aliens. You'll go, oh yeah, this is like aliens. And I'm like, what if the colonial Marines were committing war crimes? How would you feel? <laughs> or like thinking that uh, the strong female character was going to be the hero that survives at the end. And then, yeah, that turns out not yeah. to happen. Oh yeah, she's also kind of a white savior as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. How, how yeah. did Steve react to that? When I first pitched the idea, both my agent and my editor were like, I mean, like, how are you, what do you, what do you mean you're going to kill the main character halfway through? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I'm going to have a bunch of characters, right? So that it looks like, so it's really hard to predict. And then they were saying like, oh, it's going to be too jumbled. If you have too many characters, you know, too many perspective characters is going to be so jumbled that the readers won't be able to handle it. And so what I did was I, I was like, okay, well, if I, if you look at any one perspective character, they're present for one third of the book. Okay, so in total, so Kamran, he gets a third. The only, the only ones who like don't get a full third are like uh, Duncan. I, yeah, that's it, just Duncan. Um, so all of them are really kind of organized to overlap and give you lots of time to really get to know the character. And I focus really heavily on strong characterization in those scenes to make sure that everything's like as differentiated as possible. And to, you know, in part to accomplish that, I didn't go after a whole lot of like characterization on some of the colonial Marines, you know, like you got to know, excuse me, like, I guess one or two, you know, but not really a whole lot. I mean, but I wanted to make it clear though, that most of them are good. I think most of the Midnighters probably who landed were decent folks you know um you don't have to control much of a platoon to do bad things you know if you have the captain and both sergeants you, you don't need a lot more so I suppose it's intimidating as well to stand up to that level of authority figure as well Oh yeah, it will. If they tell you just like, hey, orders are you go over there and don't look at me. Like, oh, well, I guess that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like, you know, and, and you'll notice that Duncan is looking for recruits, right? With Becker. She recruits Becker into the conspiracy and she approaches him very slowly. She's really methodical about it. And she does things to throw him off his game when he's talking to her about it, to get him to agree, to get him to sign on. Because one thing that's important to recognize is that once people have signed on to do something bad, they follow through. You know, people are more interested in their own momentum, emotionally, mentally, than they are in doing the right thing most times. That's one of the reasons why when people commit themselves to an awful cause, you can expect them to double down the more awful a cause becomes. It's why um, any Babylon 5 fans? Oh, I was no. a Deep Space Nine fan. It was like on uh, at the same time. So like, yeah. Okay, well, for, the, for those listening then that might be, it's why Malari's so interesting in Babylon 5. Mm. Uh, but I guess that means nothing to you guys. Anyway, people out there will know. People out there will know. I'm so proud of you people out there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry, you're not a Babylon Five fan. I'm no, no, I, I, I feel really. bad. We're we're the bad nerds here. Okay, don't don't apologize, Aaron. We're the bad <laughs> nerds here. We all know it. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean that insidiousness of of slow recruitment. I mean it 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 can and does happen, and I mean and it's not just it's not just for war crimes. It's for all kinds of things that you don't think you should do. Anytime injustice flourishes it's done it through slow recruitment okay 
And so Duncan doesn't just represent, you know, a, an active threat to the honor of our military. Duncan also represents the kinds of choices that you're offered every single day. So, you know, one of the things that is really difficult to like really kind of wrap your head around is, you know, okay, that thing that you love, it may be made by terrible means, right? If your appliances are made through prison labor and those people are forced to work on them, are you, are you paying slavers? You know, the chocolates that you eat in most industrialized countries, they don't come from fair trade. And that means also child, you know, child endangerment, that kind of thing, right? These are constant problems that are in our reality all the time, you know? And the question is, you know, what do you do when you're confronted with them? And it's interesting because I think that there's a, a real language of helplessness that we kind of try to ascribe to ourselves and we like to be part of the order. And what Becker goes through is he has to kind of decide if he's part of the order, right? Or if he's going to buck the system and, and, and what, whether or not it's really worth it. And it's for people he doesn't even know. And it's for people he doesn't even like, um, you know, where does his honor start? And, and it's interesting because he, you know, he, he doesn't like live through the experience, you know, and yeah. he doesn't get but, all the medals that he, he kind of like, that's what he signed up for. He signed up for right. glory, right? And he eats right. none of it. <laughs> right. He's talking, yeah, he's talking about his relatives the whole time in his head. He's like, my mom, the brigadier general would have said this, you know, kind of, oh, that's metal pinning language. Oh, you know, kind of, yeah, you're absolutely right. He's really motivated by career military and he's motivated by, he, he thinks he's going to be like James Bond, right? Like when she's like, I want you to do something that's maybe against the rules for me, right? He's thinking that means some secret agent shit, right? We're going to go somewhere cool and we're going to break into somewhere, right? He's not thinking genocide. And, but yeah. you can, people can get you to agree to things that, are beyond what you'd expected and you need to know you know sometimes it's a toxic relationship right sometimes it's oh we all agree that so and so needs to be thrown out of the family or we all you know it, it could be all any number of things and when you've agreed to those things you need to ask yourself like where is my oath really you know he she goes out of the way to make him feel like he has joined an elite club. You know, you'll notice the sergeant doesn't come to recruit him directly. The sergeant, who's a total bastard, expresses appreciation to Duncan, who brings him that, right? He doesn't get to win the sergeant's love directly. And that makes it more enticing. Becker immediately when hearing that he'd been recommended was like, well, I know I thought the guy was an asshole, basically the entire book thus far. <laughs> but now he's a, he's a, he's okay, I guess. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's so easily manipulated back then. And it's only when he discovers that he's been manipulated that he becomes a good person, but it's too late. The system that he's created has already been set in motion and it kills him. And I, th I think it's pretty, pretty fucking cruel that you get shy to set up her own, like the demise of everyone else and then kill her. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> she doesn't even get a last shot in. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. That, that really That's... caught me off guard too. And I mean, honestly, if it, I think that was probably my favorite part of the book because it was so unexpected. Um, but yeah, it was it was just a complete shock. I, I think I was in denial about her dying for a good week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you didn't really get any more pages after that, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, did she really just die? I think I messaged you, uh, like after I read it, I'm like, this did you really just book? kill her off? <laughs> <laughs> like, what just happened here? She's oh, gonna yeah. come back, right? She's just just really hurt. She's not dead. <laughs> That's one of the hard oh. things about dealing with Alien, though, because you're always like, you know who's going to live. You can look at any crew now and be like, that one. You know, 
Like we knew Call wasn't going to get eaten, you know, like that kind of stuff. And, and like Alien Three, you, you don't necessarily know who's going to live because they're all a bunch of bald guys, you know. Like I have trouble telling them apart sometimes. <laughs> Some of those are just you know British fable British actors that you can't tell apart. <laughs> Charles Dance is okay, fine. <laughs> Feet possible weight. <laughs> uh, I I like how uh, British people put every British person in every British movie. I, I'm, I'm there's, only really a, there's only a limited talent pool. Let's be honest. <laughs> I'm always impressed by your ability to cram in every British actor. <laughs> oh no, I don't uh, really watch British films. I don't find us that interesting, if I'm honest. Oh, oh, so same, well, the same, world as, same as humor. I, I can't stand British comedy. I would rather watch the American remakes. Hey, same. The British Apart stuff's just IT too crowd. embarrassing. IT crowd is brilliant. Yeah, fair. So, so yeah, no, I just, uh, I really didn't want you to be able to predict who would win, uh, who would live. You know, it was, it was really, it's always frustrating because it's so formulaic. And I really wanted to make sure that, like, you know, and it's just like... I love that Cameron lives yeah that was oh, that was actually quite yeah. surprising that was surprising yeah. as well that I'll, was i'll agree with that brutal because he lost everything lost his friend first lost the job like lost something that had been building for years and lost his family and then lost the will to live basically <laughs> and a hand he also and lost a hand. A hand, his dominant yeah. hand I was going to say that that's one of the things that kind of threw me off about him too. I, I thought he was not going to make it through the end of the book. Once he lost his hand, I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's it for that character. And then when he came back, I, it threw me for a loop again. There were so I, many loops. <laughs> I, I really liked like, the fact that Duncan went to grab his hand that wasn't there and that would have saved her from falling, <laughs> but it wasn't there. The look at her face and I was like, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I love that line that I, I like he'd cut it off again just to see the look on her face. <laughs> <laughs> so good, but like there's there's so many elements of horror in this. You know, there's like you know cutting off of the limb, uh, people being like burnt to death or suffocating in gases, drowning. You've pretty, <laughs> pretty much done a number on everyone in this. Uh, yeah. Is there any any deaths that you wish you could have included? Like, would, would if you would could rewrite any of the deaths, would you do it in any other way? Oh, I mean, the book's brand new. <laughs> <laughs> oh Brad no, live? no, <laughs> I, Brad, you got like one of the best ones. You yeah, got, I made sure that both halves went into water. <laughs> Right, I was no, really I, explicit I was... about that. <laughs> no, I, I was happy with that. That was cool. <laughs> I was really torn up about Percival's death, actually. <laughs> it was pretty drawn out from what I remember. <laughs> yeah, how, how, yeah, what was that like, like seeing, seeing... First of all, did you, like, when your names got onto the page, you, were, were you just like, wow, uh, I'm getting a lot more screen time than I was expecting? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm never really, I'm never really sure how that kind of stuff's gonna go down. So it's always cool, you know. It, it, it was, it was really sweet to see. And then I, I think I said something about you. Um, what was it? It was, it was in my bloody notes. I was looking earlier. Um, some sort of justice towards me for something, and I can't remember what it was. But you now it, it, it was cool to see us die. Because yeah, yeah. How how often do you see that? Well, I was you know it's always weird because it's like, hey, so uh, since you're being such a good friend to me, I'm gonna murder you on the page. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's well, it's it's a bit it's a bit of immortality in the stuff that we dig, you know. Oh yeah, no, I I definitely um, I had I had some friends that they they finally put me into their book as like a person who likes showers. You know, and I was like, ah, at least I'm in there. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, so, um, uh, for me, I remember, uh, when we, you know, you told us ahead of time that you're going to name characters 
after us in the book. So, you know, we were kind of waiting to see that and expecting it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I remember that the very first pages that we read, it was the uh, deposition that I guess didn't make it into the book in full. That's right. And one of the characters that showed up on that deposition was named Bradley. And I was like, oh, I guess that's the character I'm named after. And then later in the book, when you had a, a character named Sued back, I was like, oh, OK, that's my character, not this other one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the other one was just, you know, just kind of a small little thing anyway. So I guess uh, I thought my role had already been put on the page <laughs> and was out of the way. So it, it surprised me when the real role showed up again and. Uh, it was fun. I, I, it was almost surreal to see that and, and read it. And yeah, I was definitely happy with it. I thought it was cool. I, I really enjoyed mm-hmm. like the, the sort of banter that was in the chat with all of us and like how some conversations kind of made it into a variation in the book, like mm-hmm. the prey suits, like mm-hmm. y- you and Jason were like talking about maple syrup and <laughs> fucking around and then alex is like hey i can use this and it works <laughs> it was amazing what so um obviously you know brad's there is this super fucking water guy who you know very specific kind of knowledge that you tapped on quite a lot in terms of what you were doing um but in terms of like our general contribution towards you, what you were doing, what happened in, in, in the story and, and the details, you know, what do you sort of think is the most significant thing that we contributed towards you? Wow. <laughs> uh... I mean, like, like as I'm listening to it, you know, I had, I had the audio book on and, and my missus is next to me and I go... I contributed that. <laughs> I mean, the largest cigarettes. That, that's the problem but, is like there's so much stuff in there that's like that. But, but like, what 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 would you consider to be the most significant thing that I mean? Because I can I can pick out little details, perhaps that I went, Alex, be a nerd, do this if you go yeah. into it. But what what's you know what sticks out to you is is the most you know the big thing, the biggest things. I'll 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 tell you. Uh, but if people start coming up and talking to me like this, I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna be like, I can't believe I let that slip. Okay. <laughs> but the biggest thing that you contributed was after you did the interview for Cold Forge, and you were talking to me, and you were like, "Oh, you really didn't take it where I thought you were going to." with the genetic manipulation thing with the with the with dorian and his fantasies wasn't it yeah yeah i really thought that you were gonna make blue turn into some kind of monster (laughs) 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 and i was like oh that is funny okay all right i could probably work with that (laughs) okay not not quite what i was thinking there but you know uh, (laughs) And I so swear that... to God, if anybody starts trying to suggest plots to me, I'll fucking clock you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's our safe word as well. When we weren't supposed to influence you, we we had that's to right. say plot. <laughs> yeah, that's and right, I because... think I was the biggest violator of that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, you should try through... this. Oh, you should try this. <laughs> that's right. Plot. I just want to go oh. through grabbing little bits of inspiration because my books are gonna be my books. <laughs> Like there's too much hard work to be like, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta like, you know what I mean? Like, e- how how bad would you feel if like you worked for something like forever and ever and ever, and then somebody came along at the end and like put the cherry on top, and you were like, fuck, that's awesome, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> no, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of, um, I mean, there there were so many uh, co- contributions like that though. I mean, like. Um, just talking i mean like like clara your love of marcus really really made me put a lot of marcus in there oh I, i'm you know? very satisfied with the amount of marcus we got <laughs> and, and brad and and bishop and all of these you know you've you put as many androids as you could in the even the good boys i, I really liked that yeah and i mean 
Brad, I, you know, I was really interested in, you know, all of the, all of the chemistry, all of the aquatic chemistry that we were talking about and all of the kind of industrial working conditions, because you are very much a blue collar scientist. And, you know, <laughs> because you work on the most disgusting shit, literal, it's, it's, actual. <laughs> I had a career change. I don't do that anymore, but I still work okay. with water. Yeah, <laughs> just... but leachate is, is the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> yeah, that stuff's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I gag really easily on like scents and stuff. So I don't, you know, so um but yeah i mean that 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 was uh, you know just as much as anything you know like all the bleeding rocks and, and all that stuff was put in there to entertain you you know that was people, entertaining you know and, and and so yeah there are factual con uh contributions obviously that are all through there and those aren't the things that i remember as much the things that i remember as much are the things that i wrote you know, for you guys, because I like you guys. Um, so Aww. the, the Mondo <laughs> reference made it into the final draft, right? Yeah. Oh, did it? I, 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 I mean, I, it was there when last I checked, but then so was all my, you know, metric system. So <laughs> that was I, the I, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw like I, nine feet on something and I was like, ah, oh, is that anyway i really liked how marsalis picked up a, the machine gun uh, it's just kind of sad that she didn't have a cigar toke on uh. <laughs> I, I think she should have like pulled one off noah's dead body like out of his mouth and like <laughs> was that was that what that was supposed to be it was a reference to that old comic with the alien with the gun and the cigar uh what was that Brad, stronghold Brad, Brad. I was going to say, don't you dare forget who that guy was and what that comic was. <laughs> I've, no, I've read scary. it. It's been a while. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah. Have you, have, uh, have you forced Drew to read that passage yet? Hmm? Huh? Drew hates Jerry. So I like to um, <laughs> tell, him, tell him how wrong he is about hating Jerry. Um, it, I've, I've been... I've been subcontracted to read on on his behalf, so. <laughs> oh, so you can just be like it's a bunch of Jerry references up in here. <laughs> I'll highlight non-stop. them. And, I'll highlight them and just send them in chat with a, a bunch of supporting pictures. <laughs> just be like, this is trash. This whole book is trash. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I like in in the book. I like that no matter what happens to Blue Marsalis, uh, she is anchored to technology. So first, mm. you know, there's the machines breathing uh, for them, and then there's Marcus being a body for them. And then there is the translator box right, stuck to the head of Blue or Marsalis to translate everything. No matter what, there's this constant dependence on technology. Was that intentional? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people are dependent on assistive tech all the time. And she has a hard time. And these devices are great. Like, these devices are, I mean, ruggedized, highly accurate communication devices. Uh, in the case of her Android body is just incredible, right? And she's having a tough time. I mean, you know, the trying to depict the struggles of people who are reliant on assistive technology uh, is, is a major part of Cold Forge and a major part of Into Charybdis because of, you know, the struggles that we've had with, you know, my own child and, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to make sure that she had assistive tech needs and requirements and that they were really difficult um as as they became marsalis what did you enjoy about the sort of weaponry um and 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 i guess different tactics to approaching the xenomorph because we've always seen as the the alien as an unstoppable force even the colonial marines and aliens couldn't defeat them i think mm -hmm. being 
put in a position where like the mid the midnighters like they do this they eat aliens for breakfast <laughs> you know uh it's it's an interesting portrayal um w- what did you enjoy about uh bringing that to the story so you know i am very familiar with the way that we handle threats and in 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 the real world and when a threat emerges that is really significant something like the alien you better believe that there's a defense industry response and some of the com- companies in the defense industry that are at the forefront of this type of response are actually listed in the book. You'll actually hear references to, you know, Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Northrop or Teledyne Brown or whoever, you know, and uh, assuming they still exist or whatever. There are a bunch of brands that I like shoved into the future, just like, hey, is that real? You know, like, uh, and they let me get away with it. So I guess so, you know, Reebok is still there 600 years from now, as we know. <laughs> or <laughs> it's only 200 years um right 2184 yeah yeah so not even that long right it's around the corner so so um i really liked uh trying to work with what i felt were fairly realistic weapon systems that could be developed in response to the xenomorph threat because i do think that you know it, it's, it's clear that the colonial marines mission logs are forwarded back to the company right at the end of aliens and before alien three they make it really clear right that they get the eev so that means that that you better believe all that footage got passed around the prime contractors immediately like there's no way that the government doesn't turn around and say like okay i want something to stop that And where I think the books always fail is they always have these clandestine efforts to like weaponize the xenomorph and all this other stuff. I really think that it wouldn't take very long for the colonial marines to get on top of the xenomorph. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that when you fight the xenomorph, either either you're outright winning or you're outright losing. (laughs) You know, and so they have to have these really great assistive tech, you know, and and you, you see, you see Becker at one point says like, oh, this is just fox hunting, you know. Um, and then, of course, he has to go in alone with the, the crew after that, and it's not as much fox hunting as he thought it was. <laughs> yeah, but less, less uh, bougie. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, like that the 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 whole you know national dynamics sunspot good boy. That's just a Boston dynamics big dog with you know a pintle mounted auto turret on it and like most of the tech to make that work already exists um the idea of launching them from missile launching tubes though i mean like we are really interested in like manipulating the battle space very quickly so there's you know there's that kind of ideology there's a whole lot of trying to like improve the the user experience of being a colonial marine right so the prey suits are really nice uh, and they work against everybody except Marsalis, who understands what they're doing. You know, if you're uh, familiar with reactive armor principles, then you you don't do as well, or that you'll do much better against the prey suits. But you know that kind of stuff where they're all getting heads ups all the time regarding one another. Um, the unit cohesion's better, uh, and uh, you know there's a moment where. Um, Duncan gives the exact same order that Gorman gives. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the incinerator the, moment. Yeah, yeah the yeah. flamethrower. Yeah. Because it's the right order. <laughs> it's just Gorman's mumbling it. <laughs> I actually went back and I was like, I really can't think of a better way to handle the situation. They're afraid of fire. You need to back up you know like well the, the right way to uh, handle that situation would have been not to go in in the first place once you realized you didn't have any uh sufficient firepower and you only had the right. flamethrowers to work with but right uh, also i really enjoy how the first officer of a ship who also has a power loader cer- certification is like whoa 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 you can't go firing caseless ammunition underneath nuclear reactors and i'm like when did you get that education <laughs> She had the um, you know, learn as you sleep 
things in the crowd too. <laughs> I, I'm just guessing that it's like something to do with managing the engines on the Nostromo. That must be it. <laughs> oh, those are the primary heat exchangers. How the hell do you know that? Do you see a lot of nuclear plants where you're from? <laughs> she must have just brushed up in, in the downtime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she stayed at a Holiday Inn oh. last night. <laughs> Uh, I, I really like um, that there's there's so many gold uh, one-liners in this, and and I like how it like that that some some stuff like made you know Aaron roll his eyes, like the um, the line where like I prefer artificial human myself. And you're like oh oh wait, <laughs> they all say that. Right, everybody out today. <laughs> Well, it's, it's it's the one thing I remember from the conversation. Um, I I I thought like the line uh, it's the only way to be sure. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> but it it works, right? Like you you never use a, or drop a line or introduce a character without it having the intended effect it's supposed to have. Whether mm. it's introducing a character from an unused Alien Three script who's a <laughs> scientist and spelling his name correctly, or oh you god, know... can you the, the, do you remember the amount of discussion that went into that? <laughs> I, I do. Just... <laughs> I was like, just keep it the same. <laughs> I well, I, was... I... <laughs> I couldn't uh, bring I mean... myself to do it. <laughs> I know because I mean, you're very particular, and I, that's what I, I love about you, Alex. So it's fine. I mean, I I I had a rationalization for why the spelling would have been changed, but I I guess you just didn't like that. So yeah. <laughs> you know, what? let's let's add that to the AVP wiki so that people know. <laughs> because I mean, the, the thing the that day, bothered me is that people would look for it and like, hey, that guy, he's not mentioned in the book, and I was like, actually, he is. <laughs> yeah. Different spelling. <laughs> Yeah, because it was, was he on the yeah, it was on the wiki, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, if you yeah. if you look up With Matt Shurita, wrong. Yeah. Mm, yeah, you find him and it's like but Matt Shuita is not a spelling. <laughs> I'm gonna get some hate mail from Japan, like <laughs> but, but we got we got a we got a we got an expert, right, to to testify on that one. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When so, all three, when when all of us went to the same bloke to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Big shout out to Mitch Mitchell. <laughs> Is that why he's in the book as well, Mitchell? Yeah, and also he's in there. Uh, the nickname Kaito Mushi was uh, coined by him. Oh really? <laughs> nice. Oh, I didn't yes. realize uh, all that. That's was so that the, cool. ja- the, the Japanese name for the alien? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it means like black bug or something. <laughs> that was that was another big discussion as well, from what I remember. Yeah. yeah, he did a good job. He he was very helpful. So, yeah, I I uh, I love making references. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I make as many as I possibly can, and also any Jurassic Park references I can fit in. Uh I I don't know whether you... I caught all of them this time. There was a there was a reference to Space remember. Beast in here too, wasn't there? There was. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I try to go deep in the alien lore and try to bring out some of the good stuff, you know. Um, because I can go I can go there a little bit better than I can with something like Star Trek, where it's like there's so much to know. Like everything is deep in the lore. <laughs> and and no Kramer, yeah. even going as far as the memes go, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because just like. I was just like, I'm just never going to put any coffee creamer in my alien books. I'm going to make sure that there's never any there. And it's always going to be some, some, I'm going to start using it as like, if anybody makes any reference to there not being coffee creamer, that person will die. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Mark my words, if they manage to lure me back for a third, I'll make that joke in there somehow, somewhere. Do something with (laughs) moss. What? Do something with Oh, I've been saying that for years. He's the one character that survived the original trilogy, and nobody has ever done anything with him. 
he gets a brief mm. mention in the Whalen Utani report. No, and, yeah, and, and resurrection the author of the Space novel. Beast, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that 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 was from the resurrection novel. And yeah, then, then made it further in. Mm. Mm. Is there anything we haven't covered? Uh, oh yeah. So, I I really like what really hurt me was the killing off of Banu, like right in front of oh. her dad, like, and 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 how and how uh, how rebellious she was in her last moments. So brave for a little kid. <laughs> yeah, the clenching of her little fist, and I'm like. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. And then her screaming, squealing like a rabbit, like I've heard that sound before. So I was like, Oh, I know. <laughs> You're breaking me. I hate you for that. I, hate you. I know. I know. I was, <laughs> when I wrote that scene, I was just like weeping. Uh, like, I guarantee you, I felt everything you felt. Yeah. Oh, when I wrote that scene, I was really, I was really trying as hard as I could not to rely on just plain gore uh, mm. because, like, I feel like that's so easy. And I mean, because anybody can describe what a body looks like coming apart, right? Like, you just go look at a biology manual of some kind, go watch, go watch a, a Tom Savini movie, right? And you'll get to see a body coming apart. I wanted to write like what scared me as a parent, which is like a different ask that's kind of similar, right? We don't want bodies coming apart, but like it's way different. And so if you look, all of uh, everything in that scene is filtered through Harun's fatherhood. And, and so that's where most of, I think, the really good terror comes from and where a lot of the really good sadness comes from. You know, I have a child myself. Um, everybody knows who has a child what it's like when your kid falls and they, they hit their back or their head or something like that. They're so hurt that they can't even scream. Have you ever had this one? You know, and you're like, oh my god, you know, like breathe, you know, like. And I was just like, what about that? But just all the time, right? Like, and and so I really, really did as much as I could to kind of bring the fear of a parent in there without being gratuitous in the gore. And one of the things that came back from Disney was like that scene was on notice. Like they almost tried to make me change Bonner to be like a teenager. And it was because, you know, they were like, I don't know about child endangerment, basically. And I was like, you cracked Newt's rib cage open on screen. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what the yeah. fuck you're talking about. <laughs> it's thematic. And And the thing is, it's just like, I wanted to be like, when you do bad things to civilians, everybody dies, even the cute ones, even the, you know, and all the ones that you're like, well, that one's, but that, that's not a cute one. That's an old heavy set bald Iranian guy. <laughs> and it's like, by the end of the book, I bet you liked him too. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's wrong to hurt civilians war is generally a bad idea <laughs> you know and i think that especially as we've dealt with a heavily nationalistic streak and anybody who tells you that we haven't been dealing with a heavily nationalistic streak is part of it mm -hmm. you know <laughs> that's they're telling you that because they have something to sell you <laughs> you know um I, I want to say I really do appreciate the cultural sensitivity portrayed for the Iranians in this book and how you've managed to kind of show the the culture as like very common, very familial, um, beautiful in a lot of ways, the architecture, the, the slight differences and this admiration coming through the eyes of Shai as well is, is seems like the sort of person who's very open, who wants to do their best to include everyone and 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 be uh, be, be the sensitive soul, so to speak. Um, and then yeah, and then, I mean, she tries. She's not great at it, but she tries. <laughs> oh yeah, she's she's a bit shocking. <laughs> like, my favorite joke about her. <laughs> my favorite my favorite joke about her is when. 
Kamran like kind of bows a little bit like as just a regular gesture and then she bows in return <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like oh my god okay I gotta I gotta turn around or I'm gonna die of embarrassment <laughs> Yeah, that's happened to me a couple of times. I'm Chinese and I bow and people do like a deep bow and I'm like, wow. <laughs> I, was just, I was just nodding at you, man. But yeah. <laughs> Go deep. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I'm telling you if you, have, if you, if you have friends who aren't white, they have stories. They always do. Listen to the stories. They make for good books. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh I I really wanted to kind of push a message, of, uh, not push a message, I guess, but but to kind of inspire sympathy for all of the factions, including the military side, because there are people who are good Marines who are doing their jobs correctly and lawfully who are murdered in this book. If you think the Marines are portrayed badly, it's because, again, you don't know who the Marines are in this book. <laughs> Uh, traitors are not Marines, they're traitors, you know. Um, and, and so it is interesting to kind of try and portray that. And then Shy is, in a lot of ways, representative of a lot of the mistakes that we make when we try to be allies. Um, and that she is overhaul, overall good hearted, but if you look at her, she's certainly not perfect. And uh, she's also really fun to write because she seems to be aware that she's in a horror movie. <laughs> right? Whenever somebody's like, we should go out there and check it out. She's like, no. <laughs> I know how yeah. that ends. I don't want to do that. <laughs> she makes, uh, you know, and I try to, I try to keep that axiom going from the Cold Forge, which is that all the characters make the right decision. You know, like if a character dies, I want you to be like, ah, oh, that should have worked. I wish that it worked. Ah, oh, you know, I don't want it to be like, uh, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of, a lot of stories kind of function on people making predictably stupid mistakes, you know, taking off your helmet on a alien world that you just got to <laughs> kind of mistakes. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> everybody makes fun of that, but you know, that's not anything that killed them. Um everybody who did that was fine. <laughs> yeah. It's uh mm. it's the red herring, right? <laughs> right. Oh yes, I know. I know and, and I, I, I wish that um see when I was looking at Prometheus, that was one of the things that I wish it hadn't relied so heavily upon was the jump scare and the kind of kind of classic creature scare. Because it had such an interesting theme, which is like, what if you went and found the creature that created you and got its opinion on you? Uh -huh. Like, wow, that's something cool. And it's related to Alien. Like, I was so enamored with everything that Prometheus was about that, like, a lot of what's wrong with it just blows past me. Because the premise is just, like, killer. You know? Um, and I, I love, I love the, I love the whole, like, um, the idea that like the engineers are basically like the hell is this thing talking to me? And then they see the Android and they're like, oh shit, we got to kill this guy. <laughs> like you, you've committed a terrible atrocity. You've created life. I contend that the humans are the worst super weapon the engineers ever created. You know, what? that, uh, that reminds me of something else that came up in our chat actually, um, I remember we, uh, you know, cause in the, in Prometheus, David gets his head ripped off by the engineer. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You know, that's, that's all fine and dandy and everything, but then though, like for a couple of months there leading up to when you started writing uh, into Charybdis, we had a, a comic series come out called dust to dust. And mm -hmm. it involved this one part in the story where the little boy had to uh, take the androids head with him to, to escape. But, he, you know, he couldn't carry the android's whole body, so he had to cut off the android's head. And it was kind uh -huh. of this really visceral moment where it's like this little 10-year-old boy cutting off an android's head. That's, and he was, like, hesitant to do it because it was like cutting off a real person's head. But the right. android was very apathetically saying, you must do this if you want to survive. And it was uh, a pretty shocking scene for me in, in that comic. And then a couple weeks later, 
it happened again in some way, shape, or form uh, in Alien Echo. And it was a good scene in Alien Echo, too, but some of it was, you know, it, it kind of lost its luster a little bit because it had just happened in, in Dust to Dust in a way. And then it happened a third time in another book that came out shortly after that. And yeah, like, you okay, may have saved me. <laughs> I might like, have yeah. gone for it. <laughs> It's like, we, you can't do this because they've done it three times in a row now and it's kind of getting overused. <laughs> See, this is the sort of insight you can't get from a story Bible, right? Like, somebody's just like, don't cut off that android's head and have a character walk around with it. And I'm like, all right, well, I don't think I was gonna, but definitely not now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm vaguely recalling that that might have come up in our chat. And we were like, yeah, don't do this. <laughs> oh, no, you were, you were, you guys, you like straight up like pre warned me, like, yeah <laughs> um which uh, you know okay <laughs> fair enough i mean it is it is a huge temptation you know because but i mean i look at it and i'm like they already did that in alien 3 you know pulling the bishop out of the trash pile and stuff that was a massive scene right like that if that scene didn't like affect you then like you must not have a heart it was yeah. a good scene and you know to be fair i liked those scenes when they happened it was just it was getting to the point where it was like, okay, now it's getting overdone. Right. Let's, let's not do this again. Because yeah. then, then it loses its, its impact. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, what's next? <laughs> I feel like Aaron should say something because he was absent for such a long time. <laughs> that was like five minutes. Good God. <laughs> well, you're you're very largely quiet too. It's probably because well, you're very I, tired. I I I have to fight back the instincts to host so no, it's okay <laughs> like that's well, the thing with you tani it's whatever i had i had alex and scott host last year on <laughs> on their interview so you know <laughs> i i have a i have a question who's scarier duncan or dorian oh duncan duncan <laughs> yeah definitely duncan <laughs> yeah. she didn't even hesitate to pull that trigger on shy yeah yeah, yeah. Dorian would have been like, "Oh, I'm gonna say something mean to her." Yeah, Dorian <laughs> is just a sadist. He just pulls it out, pulls the whole process out, like smacking uh, Marx's head with the fire extinguisher, and then like going on this like song and dance. Oh, don't you think it's amazing how I can kill you with something that's supposed to like save people? And then <laughs> <laughs> I love that monologue. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he was just, he was like, he always acted like he had an audience. But with Duncan, she he didn't did. care who was watching. There was never this, like, you know, observation of, like, oh, I better watch what I do in front of this person. She just didn't give a shit. And the more she revealed about herself to Becca, the more Becca's like, oh, shit, this is bad. This is really bad. <laughs> well, I mean, she, sort of. Sort she was of. also I mean, efficient. Oh yeah, you know she didn't. She didn't waste any time. She got it done like right then and there. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I my my favorite scene to write with her actually was when they first get everybody uh, off the gardenia and into the command center, right? And Shy's talking to Becker, and he's like a xenomorphic entity, and she's like, "What do you mean, like a truck?" like a squirrel what do you mean <laughs> you know kind of that's a stupid word <laughs> have you never seen these things before and he's like well i've i've never seen one before kind of you know like there's this she's realizing like somebody's never seen him before and she's starting to lose her shit and then that's when duncan's like looks at her across the command center and she's like is there a fucking problem you know and what's great is at that point so so i uh, th what I always think about is when I was in college in geology class, I had the meanest teacher. I can, he's just the meanest piece of shit. And he was this, um, I, I, I had a new Palm pilot at the time, which is how long ago I was in college. Wow. <laughs> and I had set my alarm for an exam on it. And stupidly, I'd set my alarm for the time of the exam. I don't know why I did that. That was the wrong way to do it. But so I was on the exam 
<clears throat> and of course the clock was off because it wasn't connected to the internet yet because it was a Palm Pilot. Um, it goes off during the exam and the teacher uh, and I and I go, oh my God. And I pull it out and I silence it really quickly and I put it back in my bag. And it goes off again. And I'm like, it needs to be snoozed. Or it, it was snoozed. I need to open it so I can see, so I make sure I hit the right button so that it doesn't go off again. And the teacher's like, if you touch that, I'm going to fail you. And I was like, all right, well, it's going to go off again. He's like, if it goes off again, I'm going to fail you. And I was like, and this is a huge class, right? 60 people. It's an introductory class. And first of all, I didn't think about the fact that he wouldn't know who I was. And so I should have just left. But I didn't think about that. Um, and so I was freaking out. So I so I ended up filling out the rest of the test in five minutes, turning it in, you know, and failing the test, but not the class. Um, and I'll never forget the cruelty on his face and the way that he just like was so excited about it. He was so amped to humiliate me in front of all those people with massive consequences to me. Because when somebody offers to manipulate your grade, what they're really saying is, I'd like to ruin your adult life. I mean, that's what a grade is. It's your ability to make money later in our society that bases everything on classist ideals like a university degree. You know, and so I there's a scene where Duncan like kind of calls shy out like that. And being out in the open when something is obviously a predator is terrifying. And it was a scarring experience for me, even though it was just a conversation. And I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm gonna put that tiny karate instructing geology teacher in there who had small man syndrome and tried to ruin my life. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Yeah, yeah, that motherfucker. <laughs> He also used to look down a lot of the girls' shirts and they noticed and would tell me about it. And I hated him even more. Mm. The worst. Absolute yeah. worst. Especially when they're teachers. Ugh. Gross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can't give any more descriptions because I might actually start nailing down who this guy is for people <laughs> who are listening. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, Clara, like, he hails from your homeland, actually. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> oh my god. Just just a little like tidbit. Um, when I was in grade three, one of the teachers got suspended. So like grade three, we were like uh, seven, eight, nine, nine years old. And then we found find out later that he was having a relationship with a girl in our class. And they just got rid of him. They didn't press charges they didn't go to the police and he went on to go work at a girls school where he did it again so of course everyone who keeps on saying this sjw bullshit in here read it again yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah everybody has a story like that like it's always there it's it's there if you don't see it it's because you don't want to look oh it's it's disturbing but i think like that's part of alien right there's right. all of this like sexual tension unwanted sexual advances rape in symbology in relation to the beast and the face sure. hugger um anyway <laughs> on to the end of the book you kind of give a little hint to escaping um the maelstrom and mm. you kind of draw a scene you said that there were the giant heads were you thinking the engineer hall of heads down yeah. the bottom. So, yeah. so is, is this built on an ancient Indian burial ground, so to speak? <laughs> it is. So this is really roundabout, but in into Charybdis, at some point, I talk about it being a silica-rich coral atoll. And the reason why that's important is because of the way that that forms, okay? Volcanoes can form through sudden action 
from very strong magma, right? Comes up, right? Slams up through the earth. And if there's not much silica in it, has kind of jagged sides, okay? So you're thinking about like Pompeii, right? Then you have silica rich magma. And the, this is something I talked to a volcanologist to write this book in part. And this is something that she pointed out to me. Um, if you had a stable lava tube like Charybdis that kind of grew up through the earth, if it was highly silica rich, like a sandy silicate base, right? Um, it would be very flowy and it would start to form a dome. Silica rich volcanoes, especially underwater ones, have almost an oniony shape to them. You see where I'm going with this? Uh, kind of like the, the pyramid. Dan O'Bannon's pyramid that he drew for the first alien. The little, like, the one with the bit up the top. So, so it's the idea... The I'm thinking of the domes from... I'm actually thinking of the domes from, from Prometheus. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, honestly that's what I meant by the, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like the so, bubble shaped pyramid thing inspired so by Jodorowsky's Dune. Maybe, maybe <laughs> that's a stable lava tube, or maybe it's an engineer storehouse and there's something that's sucking the water away that we can't even understand. Oh, so if you were to look at the thing, you would see a dome. From the side, if you were to look at Charybdis, kind of. But again, it was like, ah, uh, how much of that can I just put in? Like, how much of that would the characters really understand? But yeah, they're basically on top of a, like the unholiest of unholy sites. <laughs> so it's another engineer installation on. I was wondering. I know, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna put in a lake of black goo, and then have the galaxy go to war, and. And I was like, they're not going to let me do that. And then they were like, all right, stamp. <laughs> I, think, I think for me at the end of it, that was the most surprising thing because it's the consequences for the rest of everybody. Right? It's like, okay, let's see how this goes now. I can't believe they let me do that. I was so, because I was, I mean, the thing is, as a writer, you want, to have an interesting setting so like i'm doing a favor to any other but anybody else who wants to write in the setting you know like it'll it should be easier to come up with plots when there's so much conflict right um but yeah i i had heard that they might want to have something that was like the expanse right and one of the things that i feel like really characterizes the expanse is that tense political thrilling right uh, and and I thought, you know, Alien is a really good setting for that. That totally makes sense to me. So let's set it off, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, this is part of what makes it horror as well. Like, it's not just a body horror. It's not just a psychological horror. It's also a political horror. You know, the idea that all of our national credibility has been totally pissed away and that we're uh, caught in the act of doing something brazenly awful just because somebody who was in support of another mission took it too far. I mean, honestly, they probably would have recalled Duncan at any point if they'd have understood what was properly going on. You know. Yeah. Again, Interesting. She's not the real Marine. The real Marines are the other people. <laughs> she's the bad guy. Yeah. I hate to tell you this. <laughs> They do have them. Lawrence and Gallagher were both pardoned while I was writing the book. Yeah. So, if if you were to write a third book, <laughs> how how many memes will it take? <laughs> <laughs> I like this question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You know. I think. Um, I you know. I I worry about how i don't know I, I you know i've had so much fun with the alien franchise and i've gotten to do so much stuff like you know i feel like i've, I've already put a huge dent in it and uh, you know somebody else needs to take the reins 
this is a really good this is you know um i i don't know it it's hard to think about those things until i really need them uh for this for me this story both came out of wanting to redeem and understand blue better because what she's dealing with can't be underestimated i mean anybody in the united states is dealing with it um but also this idea like oh well rednecks can fix anything and i was like you know it'd be really cool to have some rednecks in in, in alien and you know we see roughnecks a lot but like i don't know like i i work around a lot of blue collar folks i've, I've, I've that's been a major part of sections of my career. And, and so I, I thought, man, those people can fix anything. It'd be fun to have an alien story about a bunch of ventilation duct specialists. So, yeah. I've got to give you one thing. It's always picking unusual careers. Oh, I love doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can tell. I can tell. I'm I'm still surprised by your magical race car driver. So <laughs> I like I like odd jobs. I think it's funny that jobs are oftentimes the source of like where a book will come from for me. Uh where it's like, you know, from that book that you referenced, um I was thinking about in the I was reading in Truman Compote's in Cold Blood. And uh in that book, one of the murderers uh buys treasure maps of acapulco or somewhere you know like uh, it's like what he wants to do after he retires he's gonna steal a million dollars from this farmer after murdering his family and uh go down to mexico and dive for sunken treasure right and he's buying these things by like posting a nickel and a self-addressed stamped envelope to like akron ohio you know which leads me to believe that there's somebody in Akron, Ohio, handing out fake treasure maps. Right? And I'm like, how sad is that person? That's a fucked up job to have. And then I started thinking about what kind of a background you'd have to have, and that turned into a character, and that was Boots. Mm-hmm. You know, and, that, and then the other half of it was, yeah, I really loved Formula One at the time, and I was like, race car driver seems like a really neat career. These people have to be at the peak of their game. And I got really invested in how they do their jobs. I love finding out how people do their jobs. I interview people about their jobs all the time in my, in my day career. So, yeah. Is there uh, any other questions that either of you boys want to ask? Alex? My brain can't think of anything more interesting at the minute. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. It's like, what, 1230? Uh, no, one thirty. One thirty, and I want You're to take some questions champ. for when I'm talking to you as well. Oh yeah, we can't we can't burn. Out. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you gotta have your own. I haven't been on your show yet. <laughs> Alex is everywhere you want to be. <laughs> Just around all the time. I was like, I probably ought to book my interview with him. <laughs> okay, I felt I'm so guilty. <laughs> I've got a question for you. So when the Cold Forge came out, you were pretty scared about the fan reaction to that, right? Mm-hmm. I remember hearing you you talk about that a little bit. Were you more scared or less scared with this one? Or is it too am, early to say? Or? I'm a little more scared with this one. And, and uh, No, not really. I mean, like, I know that I can write as well as I've written before. And I believe in myself and and i and i'm proud of the work that i did and i think a big part of it is discovering the passion in what i'm doing uh but what i was afraid of was you know that people wouldn't be able to tolerate you know uh a parody or a questioning or a a look at their fan favorite you know one of the things that i love about alien is how cynical it is towards corporate life and how awful it treats Weyland Yutani. And one of the things I don't like about aliens is that it then takes that same lens and doesn't apply it meaningfully to corporations or the military. It almost looks fun until they die. You know, and 
I have lots of friends who are, who deal with complicated scenarios that, you know, maybe they shouldn't be asked to deal with. And maybe if we were more careful about where we sent them, they wouldn't have to. And so I was worried about how they would look at me picking up a fan favorite and kind of putting it through this. But I'm like, it's a dystopia. The colonial Marines aren't necessarily going to be the good guys. Um, and I really, uh, and I like the Colonial Marines, by the way. And I love aliens, by the way, <laughs> obviously. Watched about a billion times. But yeah, I was really afraid of the fan reaction of this one. And I mean, and I have been, I have been doxxed. I found a really creepy forum post where they called me all kinds of gross stuff, you know? And, you know, so yeah, I was a little worried about that. But got to write what I got to write. Was it you who got warned by somebody? The hmm? Green Arrow writer. Yo, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, it was. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I was sitting on my very first Cold Forge panel. And uh, uh, it was the Titan panel for, for like introducing all the books for the year. And I'm sitting there and this lady next to me is like writing like Robin Hood stuff. And she was like, uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting all the death threats. And I was like, from the Robin Hood fandom? Ridiculous. Like, like yeah. not like a corporate fandom, like the mythological fandom of Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> like Robin Hood stands and diehards and whatever. And I was like, okay, wow, that's messed up. And then the guy to the left of me is like oh yeah no i get death threats all the time and i was like what do you what do you write and he's like oh i write for arrow and then the 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 guy to the left of him is like oh yeah i get death threats too and i'm like what do you write and he's like i write for the tick and i'm like the tick <laughs> i used to love that show when i was little <laughs> it's like what the shit you know and so I, I yeah yeah right and and now i'm writing for star trek and you know and and i've heard a couple of times you know the whole like oh is it a diversity hire you know that kind of nonsense and i hate it that, and I, that I just want people always to disgust me when it comes to star trek it, 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 things. let me tell you something in the place where i'm from you can find somebody who has a nra sticker next to a doctor who sticker national rifle association uh -huh. And and I'm always like, do those things seem compatible to you? Do we remember the doctor's feeling yeah. Yeah, uh, specifically about guns? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, he has a real, like, he'd rather let you get eaten by the aliens than let you have a gun. Eccleston, you know? <laughs> I couldn't stomach Eccleston. Oh, uh, he, he was always he was always like, quit prejudging those aliens. And then you're like, but that one is eating people. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, typical human with your human priorities. I'm like, like uh, living? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I yeah. don't know. The, the, the me seeks think that's uh, overrated. Ah, uh, uh, well, no, but... Um, I, I I was worried about this though. I mean, I, you know, I I I was worried about what they would think about me doing that with the military. I was worried about people thinking that I was insulting the military, which I'm not, um, or that I was insulting their favorites. You know, you have to if you want them to be your favorites, the heroic members of them need to be more heroic. You know. Yeah. So, organizations are never heroes if i can just drill any one thing into your heads organizations protect organizations they they do things that are sometimes good and sometimes they're made up of heroic people who use the organization as a tool to do heroic things but there's no inherently good organization in fact the low energy state may be to drift towards evil <laughs> I like how uh, your use of um, the Marines in, in this particular story is, is kind of like the way that the 
the Wailing Yutani is trying to weaponize the alien. You know, they've weaponized the military to do their bad deeds and carry out all of these things that they'd rather not do themselves um, and, and justify it with, you know, money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and they did weaponize the alien. That's the thing that I think is funny about this whole thing is like into Charybdis is like they're always like, you know, oh, they, they've got a plot to weaponize the alien. And it's like in into Charybdis, the alien is weaponized. It is deployed as a weapon. <laughs> well, it's, it's basically blue as a weapon, too, and they want to get her back. Right. Oh, yeah. The, oh, kind yeah. of a weapon. He, uh, no, I know that they definitely want to. Yeah. They would definitely want to be able to do that to their soldiers. Mm -hmm. absolutely um get some dorian signing up for it oh uh, yeah <laughs> he would love it he'd be all about it he'd be like what i never yeah, wanted to be. join the military before today <laughs> he'd, yeah he'd be attacking him himself yeah oh oh all, hands all down while, all the while all aroused about it oh yeah. yeah yeah he'd be like can i get it naked <laughs> <laughs> oh, i want to see medeal turning into some chitness stuff <laughs> Uh, if there would ever be okay, we've got to let you go to bed, man. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> uh, we're gonna see Alex back for a third book where Dorian turns into an alien king. <laughs> just, just, oh. the, just, just the, just the junk. No okay. no, yes. <laughs> Injects his deal. <laughs> Ow. Uh, briefly, just before we let Alex go, um, the main thing about this book hold on dick jokes and aliens those don't go together <laughs> <laughs> we're 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 serious in this face fucking empire of fan fiction uh, i like the fact that you included face fucker in it by the way <laughs> oh i forgot about that i'm not to that part in the audiobook yeah i got to I that couldn't... part in the audiobook with the kids in the back and it was like <laughs> you listen to this with your kids <laughs> i'm in the park <laughs> so funny yeah yeah i was like i was like surely they're gonna have a problem with face fuckers like no <laughs> okay then <laughs> they're face fuckers now yeah whenever whenever i would like read a, a passage to to renee and like make her cry i'd be like so what do you think of my face fucking fan fiction <laughs> <laughs> Stop calling your book that. <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm terrible to be married to. It's true. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, yeah. So last thing, entangled comms. So mm. only, only people who are really into um, the Cold Forge and also into Charybdis uh, <laughs> and, and the RPG... Uh, uh -huh. To a certain degree, there, there have been included Easter eggs in all of these, tying tying the, the whole entangled com situation together. Uh, do you, would you like to reveal that to everyone now? <laughs> oh, just that Rose Eagle uh, somehow was used. It mm. did make it out of the Cold Forge because it's in it's in into Charybdis. That's how information is uh, monitored. And yeah, and, and at some point, Noah, I think it is, is like, oh, that's hack proof. No one can hack it. And it's like, dude, they hacked it in the last book. <laughs> so, but of course, how do you hack entangled communications? This, it is kind of a ridiculous concept. But I will tell you that this is, you know, Charybdis's data structure, data relay structure is all based on kind of real concepts that are being discussed about how to deal with relativity across and, the stars and yeah actually I, that's one thing I, I meant to bring up and i totally forgot until just now and when you guys mentioned it again that was always how i envisioned communications taking place in, in the alien universe and then you put it in the book and, and it was pretty much spot on with what i envisioned and i was like oh that's that's so awesome so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such an easy trope to go for. I will tell you that my physicist friends are like, yeah, okay. You know, but like, I'm like, yeah, you know, every other sci-fi author gets to use entangled comms. You know, it's, it's, it's the thing. It's the thing now. It's what we do. Yeah. Stylish. It's in. Huh. 
I mean, it makes coffee. sense to me. That's why I like it. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, I like making jokes about Marcus having a wireless receiver. Like, if you look, if if you didn't solve the mystery of how the ga the cages got open in the Cold Forge, I dropped another couple of hints in, into Charybdis. Yeah, so. some, someone had mentioned that in the group. Um, how did Marcus... Uh, how, how did like um, the the thing get hacked? How did the aliens get let out? <laughs> when it very specifically says it's a manual only lock in the Cold Forge, it's like you can't you can't hack that. They're air gapped because you wouldn't want them to get hacked. And it's like, yeah, well, if somebody hacks your wireless Android, walks his ass down there and opens the gates, what are you gonna do? <laughs> yep. Nothing oh. is secure or foolproof in the alien universe. <laughs> oh, nothing's secure or foolproof in any universe. Did you know they broke quantum cryptography? Really? Yeah. There have been some tricks that can break quantum cryptography. Like, fuck it. Nothing's hack proof. <laughs> oh, no. That spells hell for my porn collection. <laughs> <laughs> anything with Substantial as it is. <laughs> Anyway, thank Probably you. Probably takes like two hours to decrypt every morning. Yeah, it does. It really puts a spatter in the works. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> Sorry, I had to one up Aaron with his injecting Dorian. <laughs> That's oh. right. Yeah. Why, why are you judging, Aaron? <laughs> Look, I, I have no like intention. <laughs> That's right. Brad is the only gentleman here. Yeah, I have well, no intention I, I was of just... one-upping anybody on that one. So I was just going with what you laid down. <laughs> That's true. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I really do. Okay. Have we have we finished being uh, the lone gun people here? Are we all good? <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think you're ever finished. I think you're in for life. <laughs> yeah. Well, when book three rolls around. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Once we make this a New York Times bestseller with all our memes. Hey, I will tell you straight up, if it hit the bestseller list, I can pretty much guarantee a book three. Okay. All right. <laughs> I will I will tell you that much. If it hits the bestseller list, I won't make an extra dime, right? I already got all the money that I'm ever gonna get off that book. It's work for hire. It's not like Alan Dean Foster's cool contracts where he gets royalties. Or oh, where he's not getting paid well, anyway. Well huh. <laughs> cool contracts with the previous people that were then bought by the worst people. Um yeah, but if it hits bestseller, don't worry. I'll be back for book three. It's that's not a question. Excellent. <laughs> what if uh, what if Scott Sigler comes back and writes another book that's even longer than this one? Are you going to try to come back for a third one and, and write one even longer than his again? Because I mean, you two seem to be trading back and forth on that. So listen, that's the other case. <laughs> <laughs> Or, 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 you know, I mean, like he, he, you know, after, after Phalanx came out, I kept hearing how great it was compared to Cold Forge. And I was like, I gotta take this motherfucker down a peg. <laughs> <laughs> so when he comes and he kicks my ass again, I'll have to return. It's like putting the high score on an arcade machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, we'll I'm be, the best at aliens. <laughs> we'll be seeing a sequel to Phalanx in, um, the new uh, anthology yeah, book, that Prey. Ultimate oh, Prey sweet. book, the AVP. Have... So, so he's been retconned to the AVP universe. So it's no longer oh. competition, technically. Oh, <laughs> oh he yeah, is. Just means they're he all the same empire. fans. <laughs> yeah, they're all the same fans. It's still competition. <laughs> I like that they used to be like back when I first got the Cold Forge contract. I couldn't use any of the Black Goose stuff originally until covenant came out because all the black goo was in prometheus and prometheus was a separate license for some reason and avp is a separate license aliens is a separate license predator is a separate license and prometheus was a separate license and then of course as soon as covenant came out it bridged anything anybody would have wanted out of prometheus <laughs> and so um yeah so i always think about that <laughs> so goofy uh, but I'm good. just trying to imagine, like, what if somebody was like, I just want a, just a Prometheus book. Like, I don't want the rest of the Alien universe. I only want the Prometheus license. <laughs> that, I hope that happens. So dead on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a lot to do with it. Uh, 
So yeah. Cool themes. Cool themes. Mm. Should have been amazing. <laughs> re re it is amazing. <laughs> I, 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 there are certainly parts where I'm amazed. I'm like, ha, 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 Holloway deserved to die. That guy definitely deserved to die. I'm just going to say it. Like, I would have killed his ass too. Good job, David. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's up, Tin Man? You probably can't feel feelings. You suck. I hate you. And I'm like, all right, poison him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that, that guy's so annoying in that scene. That would have been nice to have um, Blue do that in the coffee filter again, spiking people's drinks, you know? Yeah. I like it better this way. I like I like using the laws of robotics to kill our owners. I think yeah. that that was... Just going to yell out, plot. <laughs> <laughs> I've not signed up for a third book. You can say whatever the hell you want. <laughs> All right, Titan's everybody to... harass Alex with new ideas. <laughs> oh, I'll block just kidding. you. I'll I'm just kidding. <laughs> kick you right out the airlock. <laughs> uh, you had your chance to kill me in the book and you didn't. <laughs> That's right. I'm regretting it every day. <laughs> all right. So uh, for all of you out there <laughs> who are late to the party on uh the lone gunman helping Alex out. You you can listen to uh, more of our stupid crap going on at Aliens Gateway Station, where me and Brad admin, or you can uh, suffer the That's consequences. on Facebook. Yep, on Facebook. Um, suffer the consequences of our uh, memes following the Instagram, and sometimes <laughs> I repost them too. Uh, you could hear more from sleepy Aaron Percival over here, over at AVP oh. Galaxy. I record mine at normal times for me. <laughs> you've, been, you've been a great sport. I really appreciate you making the time to stay awake way past your bedtime. Thank you. Way past, way past. <laughs> so proud of you. <laughs> and it's Alex. almost two. <laughs> this is what time you wanted to do the last one. I was like, no. <laughs> I'm glad no. you said no. Good job. Alex, thank you for uh, including us on this amazing adventure. Um, it was an honor and a privilege uh, to be in this selected alien coven. <laughs> I'll never forget the memories. <laughs> <laughs> the privilege was mine. <laughs> I'm done. Now go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's, oh, no. it's fantastic. And I can't wait to see your other... Um, writing in your books. I'm going to have to rewatch uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine to read your That's right. Book. Later this year, Deep Space Nine and also a new space opera from Orbit. So, Yes, excited. I hear it has what robots in profession. it. Hmm? What, what oh, jazz profession? pianist and glam rocker. <laughs> you being serious? I am. Oh, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> the code name was Jazz and Giant Robots, and um, which we we jokingly it's a joke because it abbreviates to J A G R, like Jaeger. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Pacific Rim joke. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, yeah, I'm really excited about that. So, um, the first book of that one comes out sometime either this year or early next year, and it's a trilogy. Uh, so. That means you have to do an alien because you just do trilogies. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, I what I've been saying is if I could get three trilogies, I could get it as a box set and have like the trilogy trilogy. <gasps> Has to be done. <laughs> well, you know what you're doing now. No choice. Alien 3. More, more <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to get multiple publishers to work together with multiple licensors <laughs> so that I can have them as one box set. Just make your own. Just make your own. <laughs> Just Fine. <with> duct tape. <laughs> Is it going to be know, awkward, you... like, nine by nine profile? Like, you three can, by three? You, do the, um, <laughs> you know, you can do the artwork on it, and it's fine. Just, just hey. literally do it yourself. Hey, if you do make an Alien trilogy out of this, and they release it as a box set, that means they got to re-release the Cold Forge in hardcover. Oh, I know. That's what I keep hoping for. I've actually been hitting the editor up to do that. I was like, with you guys a different totally cover? release the Cold Forge. Oh, man. There's been a lot of people asking for it online. I've seen it. Should let the editors know. Yeah. 
You should let the editors know. <laughs> yeah, good old yeah. five backpipes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe not with that cover, but good old Quint. There, there, there was there was a hardworking intern at Titan that put that together. You leave him alone. He tried his hardest. Mm. Should we sign off as, as our characters in the book? <laughs> Well, That's right. You know, hey, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can sign off as the last survivor of Into <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm last. <laughs> go on, so I guess I would have to go first because I was the first one to go. That's right. <laughs> this is Corporal Sudbeck signing off. Adam Percival. Uh, Alex White signing off. And this is Tian, the Red Silk operative from Yutani, the last survivor of Intergrimness. <laughs>